Well, hello. Uh, so I'm Casey. Uh, this talk is uh, about using Perl Critic to do security audits. Specifically, uh, it's based on a sort of a case study of some work that uh, I recently did with some legacy uh, CDI applications. The idea here is that, uh, well, I guess I should ask, how many people are maintaining code that's, say, 10 plus years old, still running? CGI scripts? Not too much. You? All right. <laughs> nice. Um, it seems like, uh, especially larger companies, like big enterprises who use Perl back in the day, you know, you get into this legacy situation where you never want to upgrade. The costs are too great. Um, but if uh, you get a security audit and you find out that you're full of holes, then, you know, you've got a big problem. So this is a sampling of uh, some of the work that I did use Perl Critic to try and automatically find uh, potential vulnerabilities in a large code base, um, mostly CGI scripts. So uh, it's definitely uh, Perl maintenance. Um, the one thing that I want to say right off the top of the, the talk is that I put in the abstract that I would upload some modules to CPAN. I'm not going to do that after all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they're not prepared. Um, the the stuff that you're going to see, the, the code that you're going to see, is sort of the high-level, uh, simplified form of some of the, the things that I did. Uh, and um, I can't, or I haven't had the chance to uh, tease that out of uh, some of the proprietary stuff. So um, hopefully soon. Uh, so yeah, this is about, obviously, web security. Um, Cross-site scripting and SQL injection, we're going to take a look at at both of them, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a show of hands on who understands these terms, um, has actually interacted with code uh, or that has either had a cross-site scripting a, a vulnerability or an SQL injection vulnerability, or has had to code around it. Yeah, just about everybody. Great. Okay, so you guys understand this. Uh, basically, what happens is when you take input from an unknown source, you know, and uh, then you just use it willy-nilly without validating it or sanitizing it. Uh, then you run the risk of a potential vulnerability, either by an attacker or an unwary user, or uh, some combination of the two. Um, so uh, a common form of, of cross-site scripting will be uh, strategically formed HTML, or injected JavaScript. So if someone inputs something on your form or through an API uh, that happens to have some HTML, that happens to have some JavaScript, either because they meant to or they didn't, uh, then they can gain access to your application, they can gain access to your APIs, your users' information, and so on. Um, so the common example, uh, you know, uh, what's your name? Fill in this form. Uh, normal people <laughs> are typically going to just put in a name. Uh, attackers will put something like this. Um, you can get more clever with this uh, if you, uh, as an attacker, but this is a pretty basic example. And if you've got a simple program that's just going to spit this back out, uh, then you're obviously you're going to run into trouble. Um, you're going to get this alert. Uh, if you use that piece of data in any other page, if some other user happens to run across that piece of data, then you're talking about infecting your whole site, big problem. Um, you can fix that. You can escape it. There are a number of ways to fix it. This is one. Uh, SQL injection is uh, similar. Um, can be uh, just as devastating, even more so. Um, so often, this is again uh, user supplied information by a form or an API. It can cause a whole bunch of problems. Uh, so the example here is very similar. Um, <laughs> my next slide is going to be wrong. Uh, I copied that. Uh, pretend that this has uh, SQL characters in it, and then we'll be good to go. Um, so the idea here, though, is that in this form, uh, you've got your variables and you're making these assumptions that they're okay. And in your CGI script on the back end, of course, uh, you just take them willy-nilly and throw them into your SQL. So in the event that name or ID has a, a quote character or a parenthesis or something like that, um, you can really mess yourself up. Now, uh, in this example here, here's a, another good thing that, that folks often forget. Uh, the system is going to generate this value equals 42 for a hidden field. 
And if you just assume that that's actually what you're getting from your forms, then you still run the risk of being, uh, of having an attack be successful because uh, if someone pretends that they went to your form and posts this information, then the ID will be wrong. Uh, the, there's a classic uh, XKCD uh, cartoon which explains it, sums it up well. Um, if you name your child Robert Drop Tables, uh, then you know, you're gonna you're gonna destroy your database. But you guys understand the concepts here. Um, everybody's seen this, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I long for the day that I could do this uh, to my kids' school. But, uh, anyway, uh, again, we can fix this. One of the ways that we can fix this is that we could quote, uh, use, using dbh quote from the dbi package, we can quote these uh, variables before we throw them into a, an SQL string. We could also um, use placeholders uh, and that sort of thing. So there are a number of ways to fix this, uh, but the idea is don't trust your data. Here's another example. Um, Obviously, we want a valid ID. If it doesn't equal a digit, then we know that it's wrong, um, and we should stop people from uh, from using our script at this point. Um, when I uh, when I'm dealing with legacy CGI applications and I'm dealing with this sort of problem, I often use an approach similar to this. Specifically, just uh, exiting out of the program as soon as possible if I find that uh, I'm getting malformed data and uh, I expect it to be of a certain form. Um, don't execute any code that you don't have to, and uh, I like this approach. Um, so we all understand that you know this is really bad. Uh, depending on your industry, if uh, someone finds an attack like this and they're able to successfully exploit it to get information out of you or to corrupt your information, then you can lose your business. You could get sued. Uh, it's bad news. So we need to find them and fix them, and that can be difficult if you have a large code base uh, because you're talking about the possibility of having to walk through 100,000 lines of code. And uh, that, can be, uh, that can be difficult when it's 10 years old and when you uh, have you know, developers now that were never there in the beginning and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I tried to develop an approach to at least uh, find um, possible lines of code that I needed to investigate. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so I'm using Perl Critic and I'm, and I'm trying to perform static analysis analysis to try and take advantage of the patterns in the source code. Now with the CGI scripts, there are very common patterns. Uh, we generally get information using a params method. And, uh, you know, with DBI, with DBI, there are also common uh, patterns like using do or prepare and execute and, and those sorts of statements in order to uh, perform our queries and, and change our data. And the other thing uh, to point out is if you're, develop if you're managing a, a piece of or, I'm sorry, a, a code base that um, is internal or within a constrained team, like inside of your company, then your your code base is uh, likely to have a bunch of patterns that get replicated. And so doing static analysis like this, even if you're, you're using uh, APIs that are built on top of CGI and DBI, um, you can uh, take advantage of what you know about the patterns in your source code in order to find potential vulnerabilities. And in order to do that, you have to write custom code. But I think with this talk, we'll understand how to write a policy with Perl Critic, which does a lot of the parsing uh, for you, and then uh, lets you, uh, or gives you the opportunity to do the analysis yourself. Um, so we're going to start with uh, how to write a policy. Um, so first, there's a a preamble. Oh, who's used Perl Critic? I guess that's a. And then who's written policies for Perl Critic? I expected that. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, this is definitely high level. I'm not an expert in Perl Critic, but I found it to be uh, very useful and relatively easy to deal with. So the first thing you have to do, of course, is to declare your package in the Perl Critic policy namespace. Um, obviously, do all the right things with strict and warnings uh, and read only. Um, then uh, Perl Critic utils, utils have a series of functions that you can import, which help you do things like find the first argument from uh, a method call or a function call or uh, um, find out if you're dealing with a method at all or if you're dealing with a function. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, parse out arguments, which is uh, more difficult than you might expect when you're talking about the parse tree for Perl source code, or you might expect it. Um, next, of course, you want a, a subclass uh, Perl critic policy. This is going to be your base. You're going to build everything off of that. And then we have these two variables, uh, 
the description of what this policy is trying to uh, look out for and the explanation of why it's looking out for it. This case is, is sort of a classic case. The description is just a, a random string. You know, we're looking for something. Uh, this explanation happens to be uh, a number, and that number, in this case, uh, corresponds to the Perl Best Practices book page number because that's where uh, the the Perl Critic stuff came from. So the idea was, you know, you read through the Perl Best Practices. These are all good ideas. Let's codify them using PPI, the, the Pure Perl uh, Parser, to try and find cases in our source code where we're uh, not following the rules. So we're just sort of extending that concept a little bit into the security. Um, there's configuration where you uh, configure uh, Perl Critic to understand uh, a little bit about your policy, when to call you, and what severity you're at. So the default severity for anything security related, in my opinion, would be very high. So I'm going to go to the top level. And that <coughs> variable is imported uh, from uh, Perl Critic Utils. Uh, the default theme, uh, there are a bunch of themes like whether or not uh, it's uh, uh, documentation, you know, think best practices, documentation or um, uh, object oriented themes. And in this case, we're using a custom theme. And applies to, we'll give Pro Critic the understanding of uh, which uh, portions of the parse tree should, uh, does this policy apply to. And in this case, uh, we're going to apply to a word. A word is a very broad term. Uh, but an example of a word is a is the print in a print statement or the name of a method. Uh, so, again, very broad. Um, but any time that we find one of these in the Pro Parse tree, Pro Critic is going to uh, call your policy and ask it to find a violation. So that's what we do next. Is uh, you want to try and find out if um, this instance of the word that we found is going to um, cause a violation. This is a contrived example, uh, but the idea here is uh, you get uh, your policies uh, self, your own object, and the element, which will be this word object. And if the element uh, as a string equals print in this case, so some sort of print statement, um, then we'll keep it and we'll, we'll continue. Otherwise, we'll say that this doesn't, this doesn't violate this particular rule. We only care about print statements. The next thing I'm going to do is parse the arg list, and that'll give us a list of, of uh, arguments for a print statement. And then uh, if, the, if we happen to have more than two, then we'll return that this violates our rule. Again, very contrived, but the idea here is uh, a violation of this policy would be any print statement that has more than two care, uh, arguments. Of course, you end with a one or some true value, uh, and then you've got a module. Uh, you can write a little script to run it. Uh, this is how I ran mine. Uh, you can run it, run it on the command line, but I ran it this way. Uh, so you use Pro Critic, and you use a single policy, in this case, just the uh, policy for stuff. And you can critique any file uh, that you throw in on the command line. Um, so here's an example problem script. You'll see line three, of course, has uh, three arguments to print. Um, now. I want to stop and, and talk about a tool that I find found extremely useful. Um, it's difficult to just eyeball a Perl script and know what the parse tree is going to be for PPI because it's <laughs> it's very uh, complex. And if we have time at the end of this, we're going to walk through uh, an example uh, Perl module that's parsed by PPI using the um, PPI Dumber module. Uh, this is written by uh, Brian Foy. And it gives you a nice little command line utility called P PPI Dumper. You can run it on any script. I like uh, these two command line options, which uh, don't print out any of the white space or comment uh, um, uh, portions of the parse tree. So in this case, um, if we look at that first print statement, print one, this is an example of the top of the, uh, the document for PPI. So everything is in a document. And then we have a statement. And it's nested, of course. So the first statement uh, is going to be this print one. And uh, a statement is, it has a list of objects. First, a word, again, print. Um, then a double quoted string. And then a piece of source code structure, the semicolon. So you can see how that parses out. We can look at uh, number two, uh, print two, three, and four. Uh, same deal. There's a statement. And then a word, print. Uh, double quoted, word two, the operator comma, and so on. So 
these are all on a list because, of course, in the source code, you can see that these fall on the same uh, same level. You know, there's no nesting there. It's just uh, that's part of a statement. The statement is very generic. PPI doesn't try and get more uh, clever than that. I think that's actually one of the things that makes it really work is that um, PPI doesn't try and assume that if it really understands uh, that you know two, three, and four should somehow be nested inside a print because Perl can do crazy things and uh, it, it, it doesn't want to uh, make a mistake there. So you can see that they're all uh, just in a list there. If we run this Perl program, our policy on some sample program, then we'll see that uh, we get this output. So we found a violation. It was on line three at column one. That was our second print statement. And uh, in this case, we're going to pretend that it came from line 45 of progress practices, but it didn't. Um, that uh, we'll see in the policies that we're going to look into in a minute, but that uh, uh, line number in the progress practices book, that's just one way to use PPI. You can also just give a, a more stringified uh, representation of what's going on here as an explanation. Um, so yeah, so the third line obviously had some problem. So to write a policy, you come up with some name for it, uh, subclass Perl critic, policy, uh, you configure it a little bit, and then you write a violations uh, method that tries to walk through your parse tree and uh, determine if, if something is, uh, is out of whack. So we're going to try and find uh, potential cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, and we're going to use a very false positive uh, paranoid approach. So one of the things that, that would really suck is if you're trying to use static analysis and you unintentionally throw out lines of code that might be interesting because uh, you're trying to be too specific. So in this case, um, we're going to be very broad. Um, and there are definite, there's definite ways to improve uh, the way that this policy would run, but in this case, it's going to be very broad. We're going to be looking for print statements that look like they could represent uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So we're going for you know, what we put out to the user. So what we're going to start with is the name. Uh, the policy is XSS print. Uh, of course, we're going to use all the utilities, and uh, we're going to be, we're going to have our base class as Perl critic policy. And in this case, you can see that the explanation is just uh, a string potential XSS attack vulnerability. Uh, again, the severity is high, and it's a custom uh, theme. And again, we want uh, to find words, because we're going to be looking for print statements that we want to inspect. Uh, so our violates method um, is a little complex, so we'll have to dig into it in parts. But uh, we get ourself and the element, which is going to be this print statement, because we're going to chuck everything else out with something that says print. Um, there are things that I left out of here uh, to simplify this, but at this point, you're, you may also want to do more work to determine whether or not we're printing to standard out or standard error. Um, so there's a, a utility called you know, is file handle, so you can give it an expression and it'll try and find based on the context whether or not uh, you're talking about file handle. Um, and the example that I'd like to upload to CPAN as soon as I can does have that in it. Um, so then we're just going to look for suspect arguments to this print statement. So we need to loop over each of the arguments in the argument list. And if we find anything that looks suspect, uh, because not all arguments to print, not all print statements are, are vulnerable, um, then we want to uh, say that we found a violation on this line. So the way that we can find suspect arguments, again, is to loop through each of the arguments in the argument list. That, that uh, function, of course, comes from uh, Perl Critic Utils. Uh, and we'll skip, uh, this is a, a quick shortcut, if we just have one uh, argument to print and it's boring, and we'll figure out what boring means uh, in a minute, then we'll go ahead and skip it. Uh, we don't want to continue analyzing anything that uh, would say be if we were just printing out a, a single digit to, the, to, the, to standard out, but that's not interesting because that'll never be a, an injection attack, or I'm sorry, an SQL, uh, a cross-site scripting attack. Um, but there's more, uh, more, to, more to do here. Um, we also don't want to uh, unintentionally find uh, innocuous things, like if we're printing out a CGI redirect, and that redirect happens to have a variable as the, um, as the argument, specifying the URI to redirect to, then 
we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we don't have to worry about things like start HTML from CGI, as long as the first argument to start HTML isn't, uh, isn't something strange. So in this case, uh, if it's a method and it happens to be redirect, then we don't care about that. That isn't interesting. And if we're calling something like start HTML and we have a boring first argument for it, then we can ignore that too. This, of course, could be extended. Um, if you have your own custom methods that you know uh, that you're going to be printing out, but you know that they're not going to have an SQL injection attack, you should skip over those lines. Um, so basically, weeding out the boring stuff. The boring stuff are things that aren't going to be interpolated variables where we might have a, a suspect attack. Um, so the method that we called here that we haven't identified yet is is uh, is is boring uh, argument. I'm sorry, is boring string. Um, so what is a boring argument? I wanted to put in a joke here, like you know anything my wife calls me up for, but that's not true. Um, <laughs> I never said that. Um, so what's a boring argument? So uh, if we're printing out a number or a single quoted string or a string literal, those are all boring. Uh, those aren't going to have SQL injection attacks. We as a programmer, you know, uh, spit those out to the end user on purpose, and we uh, should feel comfortable with them. Uh, a double quoted string uh, without interpolations is uh, pretty boring. If we have a double quoted string by itself, but it doesn't have any interpolations, that's not that's not interesting. Um, same thing with uh, QQ and literal here docs. So these are things that happen in CGI scripts all the time, especially the here doc thing. Um, and uh, if we're printing any of these out, then we don't want to worry about it. It's an, it's an uninteresting uh, argument to print because it doesn't have potential input that could be compromised. Um, so how can we avoid boring arguments? Um, so uh, in this case, uh, if it's a number or a string literal, or, or I'm sorry, a string or a string literal, then we'll, we'll ignore it. So this will return true in any of those cases. Each element is an object representing you know, a, a part of the, the Perl parse tree, in this case, an, an argument or a string. We want to get rid of these guys. Um, in the case of a double quote, the object for, uh, that represents a double quoted string with PPI also has a method on it called interpolations. It returns true or false if uh, PPI thinks there are interpolations in there. Um, in this case, you know, it's a boring string if there aren't any, so we'll ignore those as well. Uh, this one's a little interesting. So P, uh, PPI token, quote, interpolate, excuse me, is for um, uh, QQ. And uh, these quote-like operators, uh, in this case, can interpolate a variable. But it doesn't have an interpolate method. So in this case, I went into the source code for the double quote, and I stole the, uh, I stole the regular expression here. Um, that's what it is, just looking for non-escaped uh, dollar signs or at signs in your string. In that case, uh, it's suspect, it's worth looking into. Uh, and again, uh, so here's a here doc. So the here doc object, uh, all of these objects uh, tend to have a content uh, method, and that content method is going to return what the content is, but for a here doc, the content is not the string inside of the here doc, the content is actually the here doc label. Um, <laughs> because that's a different thing. Uh, here docs are a little messy. Uh, but the trick that we can, we can do here is uh, if you use a here doc with a label that is wrapped in, a, in single quotes, then it will not be inter interpolated. It'll be spit out as a string literal, literal, so we can treat it as a string literal. So we can just look for a single quote at the end of the, uh, the here doc label. And if we found it, well, then we don't have to worry about this. Um, so this approach is, uh, you know, find all the print statements, um, inspect the arguments to see if they have suspect content, filter uh, anything that's uninteresting, and we discuss some of that, um, and uh, then, you know, report the rest. So it's very simple. Uh, this particular approach uh, will find a lot of false positives because, again, uh, you don't necessarily have compromising uh, input for every variable that is interpolated out of a print, st print statement. For example, uh, if you define some variable to just be a string somewhere at the top of your program and then later on you print it out, this would find it and say, 
hey, that's interesting, when in reality it isn't. It'll find it and report it just the same as it would report a variable that is, uh, that whose um, assignment is from CGI param, you know. So uh, that, that will just yield a lot of noise. So an approach to upgrade this uh, would be to find all the inter interesting strings and then walk up the source tree and actually try and find the variables that have been interpolated in your output <coughs> and figure out, uh, based on their assignments, whether or not they are actually interesting. Um, that's a lot to dig into for this talk, but that is actually something that the modules that I wrote are doing. So they are walking up the source tree. Yes? Isn't it just a short hop to implement a general paint mode for PPI that be usable by everybody? That's a fantastic idea. Right, so the idea is to implement a general taint mode which would look for things like this. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. I think it would be. Um, the, the implementation that I have has a, that I personally am using right now, uh, has a couple of shortcomings. It will also report for false positives for variables that are named the same but within different scopes because I'm, I'm walking up the tree linearly. Mm -hmm. I'm not walking up a potential call stack because this is static analysis and not dynamic analysis, and that's a little more tricky, a lot more tricky. So, um, nevertheless, yeah, I think that that could, uh, that could be an avenue to explore. Very cool. But uh, Taint mode already uh, streams if you, if you try to use, uh, uh, to, to, to print out a, a variable that's, uh, that comes from CGI param, for example. That's right. So Taint mode definitely screams if you try and use input without sanitizing it in some way. Um, what I have noticed uh, from my experience is that legacy CGI scripts don't have Taint mode uh, on by, by default, and attempting to turn it on turns into a large maintenance project that many companies aren't willing to pay. Yeah, what I've seen is that people untainting variables coming from CGI param with uh, the irregular expression like a dot and right. the, the asterisk. Thing. So the easy way to get around it is to untaint everything willy-nilly without actually inspecting exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Also not that great. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, so, so this is, again, a high-level approach. It explains how to write this policy, how to look through each of the print statements. Um, and we can build on that to try and find potential SQL injection vulnerabilities. And again, attempting to use a false positive approach. Uh, the trick that I noticed here is that unlike CGI, where um, I think most folks who writ wrote legacy applications just went to the CGI interface, the CGI.pm API directly, uh, with DBI, uh, folks are much more interested in writing wrappers around DBI, which means that uh, you're often at one level of indirection from the low-level database uh, uh, interaction, such as do, prepare, and execute, and fetch. Um, and instead, you're using some higher-level API, like a, a method called query, with, or a method called uh, execute on some other object. So um, bear that in mind if you want to try and uh, automatically find database uh, injection, uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities, because uh, you may have to write custom code that looks for your internal uh, code bases interaction with the database as opposed to just going with DBI's interaction with the database. Um, so the way we would start off this policy is the same. Uh, I left out some of the more interesting bits like use strict and warnings. But uh, basically you just uh, make a package, uh, set your description and your explanation, uh, the configuration is also the same, high severity, custom uh, theme, and this is again going to apply to words. In this case, instead of a print statement or some kind of a function call, I'm going to be looking for method calls, like do. Um, so, in this case, uh, we want to, uh, our violates routine wants to make sure that uh, we have a suspect method and uh, that the first argument is somehow interesting. Uh, the, ver the concept of interesting is very similar to CGI, uh, cross-site scripting, interpolated strings, that sort of thing. Um, moving on from there, uh, we want to get a list of potential variables in, and in the argument that's in question, the first argument. And if we can find out that there are variables in this uh, argument, then we want to say that that's a violation. Now, uh, 
the SQL constructs uh, in, a, in a string confuse some of the routines of PBI a little bit because uh, the way that I chose to implement this, I try and find words in a string again, and uh, sometimes there are uh, a lot of quoted uh, strings and uh, single quotes inside of a double quoted string as an interpolation. And, um, PPI had a little bit of trouble with that, so we're going to use a little bit more of a complicated method to try and find variables this time. Um, so first, let's try and figure out you know, what a suspect method is. So obviously, we want to make sure that this element, uh, whatever we're operating on, some word, is actually a method. That's, a, again, a PPI utils, or sorry, pro critic utils function. And the way that, that it does that is it looks at our current element, and it goes up the stack, and it tries to find a pointer. Um, you know, the arrow that we use in order to call methods. Uh, and if it can find that, then it thinks that we're, we're calling a method right here. Um, I don't recall if it does indirect notation or not. Uh, so that would be worth uh, checking out if you think you're using that in your code. So uh, then we want to make sure that uh, not only is this a method call, but it's, an, it's a method with an interesting name. In this case, I'm just using the DBI methods do and prepare. Um, of course, like I said, I've seen uh, query, I've seen do query, I've seen fetch one, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, people write these routines all the time, so make sure that you're looking at uh, the, um, uh, the methods that, that your code base is using to actually take SQL and run it against uh, your database engine. We also want to make sure that the first argument is interesting. Um, it's only first argument in this case because all of the routines that I came across put SQL in the first argument of a method call. Uh, not every, uh, every system would do that, but in this case it did. Um, so we're just going to take the first argument, and uh, if it's an interpolated string or a double quoted string, and there are interpolations in it, uh, then that's interesting. And we want, to, uh, we want to note that. Also, this bottom one here, if it's a symbol, and a symbol would be uh, a variable, like a uh, dollar foo or uh, or an array, at foo, that sort of thing. Um, so if we have a, a symbol in this case, that's also interesting because that's not an interpolation directly, but it's saying that you know we have some variable here. We don't know what it is, so we should look at that. Uh, we should consider that to be suspect. There is also a method that we use here to find the variables in an argument. So given the first argument, we're going to look and try and find the variables. Uh, in this case, uh, I found that I had to use a little bit of a recursive approach, so um, this particular method just calls find, find a variable in a string. So we're going to look at trying to just find a random variable in a string using PPI. So a string from PPI is really just a, a string, and whether that string contains interpolations or not, PPI doesn't actually go to the effort on its own to try and uh, source out those interpolations or parse them out and create a more complex structure. A string is a string, and that's it. So what I wanted to do was parse it out and try and find uh, the variables and, and see if I could find them. So that's what we're going to try here. Uh, ProCritic Utils gives us this word from string method. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a string, and that string is actually just, again, a PPI object of some kind, the first argument. So if the first argument uh, can call a string method, and anything that's a quote or a quote-like quote uh, object, that, can, that has a string method. So we're going to call the string method, or um, we're just going to put dollar string, whatever it was, in double quotes and, and interpolate it ourselves. Um, so doing that, we get a list of words. So these words are literally just broken up based on uh, a space, which isn't that exciting, but it is what it is. And then we're just going to loop over those words and try and find uh, variables in them. Uh, and I wanted to be a little bit more deterministic than just using a regular expression, so we're going to dig into that for loop here. Um, I get a PPI document, uh, or I create a new PPI document based on this word. So if the word is just a regular string, uh, then this document isn't going to be that interesting. But if it's a variable of some kind, then the document will have a variable in it. It'll, it'll tell me that it has a symbol. So uh, I'm going to find I'm going to try and find the first statement in this document. It might not have a statement. Again, a plain a plain word uh, like you know my name Casey. That's not a that's not a statement. It's just a, a plain word. It's a word in your source code. 
and it's going to be it's going to be parsed out that way by PPI. But if it was a dollar sign variable, then it, we would have a document with a statement because uh, that that uh, instance it would be in void context if it was just a dollar foo, but it's still part of a statement. So I'm going to find the first uh, I'm going to find the first uh, statement, and then I'm going to get all of its statement children. S children method just gets its statement children. It filters out all the other children like operators, commas, semicolons, that sort of thing. Uh, and if I have a statement here, uh, and it's uh, a quote, like uh, something in quotes, such as uh, setting a string in SQL, you know, uh, set your name equal to something in quotes, that uh, that's going to be interesting, and we want we want to traverse that again. That's a quoted string that we've come across, and in order to traverse it, we actually need to recurse using this implementation. So we'll take that quoted string, and we'll run it through find variables and string again, and we'll just append anything that we found, and then move on to the next word. So that's just recursing. If we happen to find quoted strings as we go into uh, a parse, then keep on looking as we dig down. And that'll help us continue parsing out just to find if variables exist. Um, so if they do, in this case, we'll, we'll go on. Um, and that is, is represented by this comment here. So if, if the word happens to be quoted, traverse, go down. Um, otherwise, uh, we can continue. And we'll try and get a symbol out of this new document that we've created based on a word. Uh, so we'll try and find the first symbol. The first symbol, again, is going to be dollar foo, whatever it might be. And if we find one, then that's a variable, and we win. But if we don't, then uh, we just want to move on. It's an uninteresting plain word. So basically, once we do this and we found any variables, if we found any, then then uh, our violates routine is going to chime up and say, you know, this line in this code looks like it might be an SQL injection attack, and you should take a look at it. Uh, so this approach, again, it walks up the source. Uh, I'm sorry, the way that we could uh, fix this approach or make it uh, have less false positives, fewer false positives, is walk up the source tree looking for those variable declarations again. Um, and we could also uh, parse things out that uh, we know we're quoting, or if we have uh, routines that we're running that validate uh, our inputs, uh, you could try and look for these variables and see if they have been assigned the output of a validator routine. Uh, in the cases where that where that's true, then you should uh, move on. You shouldn't um, you shouldn't have those false positives. Uh, and again, I, I want to mention that uh, the code that I'd, I'd like to upload to CPAN for this particular policy does actually attempt to do that, and it has the same uh, the same drawbacks that I mentioned to you before, which is that it can't really take advantage of, of scope all that well in order to determine be fully deterministic. But um, but it is nice knowing that uh, you weed out some false positives if you just have a variable that was assigned a standard integer or something like that. It's not that interesting then. Try to keep track of of where you would be in a lexical scope in order to solve this, or does, is it just you haven't tried it? Yet? Right. So, great question. Uh, have I tried to keep track of my lexical scope in order to to try and follow what the stack would be? No, um, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, I felt like it would be very difficult, and my personal time constraints were such that I couldn't dig into it. Um, at that point, I felt like I might be implementing a runtime based on that parse tree or some lightweight version of it, and I wasn't sure if there would be a big bang for the buck there. Um, having said that, this particular application that I'm going for is on CGI programs, which are just like any other program. It's the top level, you know, main runner of your program. And you can start at the top and work your way down, uh, and as long as you don't have too much uh, indirection from like submodules or something, then you, you stand a decent chance, I would think. Um, that's me just thinking that you could do it better, uh, you can do a reasonable uh, attempt at it. At it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, useful resources. Um, obviously, we're using ProCritic. Definitely take a look at it. Uh, ProCritic Developer will give you the, uh, is, a, is a documentation uh, module that will give you some understanding uh, and deeper understanding of how to build these policies. It'll walk you through step by step. Uh, and explain some of the things that are going on. Um, while I was building this, I found it extremely useful to read the PPI source code to determine how it does its parsing and uh, 
it was it was useful because I could determine things like what uh, what are they really considering to be inter interpolations, and I also found it difficult to understand the here doc problem, but it was a lot easier to understand when I started reading the source code. Um, if for anything else, I find it just really interesting to look through uh, the tokens and statements uh, code, the objects that represent the, the parse tree object, um, the parse tree. I think it's pretty neat. Um, PPI dumper is a tool that I mentioned before, and I'm going to show you some output of that in a second. And Procritic Utils, again, has a ton of functions that help you if you're traversing uh, the document using, PP, uh, using Procritic. Don't be afraid to, dump, to jump right into uh, using PPI to literally go uh, statement by statement through your parse tree if you feel like you need to for anything you might be doing if you're going to build policies uh, using Procritic. Um, that uh, is what I have, um, and I think I've spoken for about 40 minutes and I started about five minutes late, so we could spend a little while just walking through the output of PPI Dumber if you guys are interested. And it sounds like I have a captive audience, so. Um, let's, uh, let's do this. So, just so you know, um, this is going to be the output. Can everybody read that or should I pop it up? It's okay? All right. Okay, so this is the output of, of just looking at Procritic Utils. Um, Prolog-shell will give you the um, uh, the location on disk of whatever app module that you wanted to uh, to take a look at, and that's all that'll spit out. So we can just pass that to PPI Dumper. In this case, I'm using capital C to uh, not show comments. I'm using capital W to not show white space. I'm using L to actually give me a line number and column information uh, for these statements. I should mention, uh, I should show this. Uh, so this is uh, the start of the package. I just want to show you what happens if I, if I keep white space uh, in, because it's a little insane. I'll just do this as a default. Uh, you can see that you get a ton of, of extra stuff here. Um, you know, in between package and, and pro critic utils, there is white space because one of the interesting things about PPI is that you can walk through the PPI parse tree and reconstruct the source code exactly as it was before. Uh, it round trips. Uh, it doesn't try and modify it or optimize it or throw anything away, so it will literally keep all of your white space. And if you're looking at output like this, you'll get very confused, or I'll get very confused. Anyway. Um, so here's a, here's the example. You start with the document. Of course, uh, you have a statement uh, statement package subclass is statement, and so everything again is uh, a statement at, at its uh, highest level. You have uh, the word bare words package and and the object itself, and of course the structure of the semicolon. Same thing with the uses here. Uh, here's an example of quote like words, and you can see that you know the content for it is is the literal Q W whatever you've got in there. Let's see. Let's jump down to something a little more interesting. All right. So here's a good example of, of something where you get into much deeper uh, levels. So you've got uh, read-only hash as, a wor as the first word in this statement, hour as another word, of course your symbol. And here's an example here. It has a percentage, so that's a symbol. You've got an, a fat arrow operator and then a list. Um, and this list might be implicit or explicit. It, it depends, so you have to be careful with that in, uh, in PPI. Um, the statement then has, of course, an expression, <laughs> which is a word, and this is our hash key, another operator, uh, a constructor for another expression, or another statement, rather, and then a symbol, and a, an operator, and so on. So you can see that it actually gets extremely complicated parsing Perl here. Um, but it's pretty neat to be able to walk through it like this. Uh, before PPI, we couldn't really do this uh, very effectively. <laughs> but you can see what the source code is. It's piece by piece. I want to try and find an if statement or something like that. Right. Right, so here's a a statement that's going to be a break statement. It's in a, a subroutine somewhere, and we can return uh, if <coughs> we have an operator. And you'll notice that these are all on the same level. There's no indentation there, so you have to be, be careful. If you would have put uh, 
parentheses, if he would have put parentheses around the bang uh, nodes ref, that would have created a list and, and indented the scope. So it's really quite quite interesting. So anyway, you should definitely take a look at it. If for nothing else, it's fun to read your source code in this way, or I found it is. And if you're not quite sure uh, how uh, what the source code is doing, or if it's a complicated operation like a, a bunch of ternary operators or something, run it through PPI Dumper, and it'll give you the uh, the breakdown really easy. Uh, any questions? Yep. Are the policies you describe on C project? No. Will they ever be? Uh, yes. Uh, but I lied to you by saying that they would be on by the end of the talk. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> Anything else? Nope. Okay, they thank you. What oh, was that now? I'm sorry? How are they at now? So if I were Damien Conway. <laughs> How about now? <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>